Good morning. What a beautiful day for us to gather together for worship. And we are so pleased to have our children's choirs and moms here for the beginning of our worship for us today. So at this time, I would ask if all of us could begin to quiet our minds and our hearts as we prepare ourselves to worship God as we are led by our children and their mothers. Now will you stand and join me in our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made.
Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for beautiful music and voices that sing your praise. For all that inspires us in love and service, we are grateful as we seek to be your people of love and service in this world. Amen. Please be seated. There's really no sense in trying to describe what it's like to bring Voces 8 from the UK to the US. Um, Really what you need to do is just sit and listen and enhance your worship experience as they sing to us and with us. Uh, This evening at six o'clock we have an incredible opportunity. We're singing music of the coronation. Choral Union will be about 60 people strong. We'll use the brand new pipe organ. We'll have a brass choir of about 12. There's some really sensational music happening tonight and just for your entertainment value, I promise anywhere in North Texas you will not find it better than right here, six o'clock in the sanctuary. It's going to be outstanding and I would love to see each and every one of you there. But for now, let us continue to worship as Voces 8 leads us. I'd like to ask the children to stay seated right where you are. You're going to have a very good seat because in just a second, all of our families are going to come down with the babies because today is Baby Celebration Sunday. It's the cutest Sunday of the year. And um, it's, it's a wonderful time for us to really appreciate all these wonderful families and these babies. And as we're watching this, this whole sanctuary be covered with the babies, I wanted to challenge us not to see them as the future of the church, which I think is something we can do from time to time. There's the future of the church. It's the now of our church. They're, they're now and they're amazing. So a, as they're coming down, look at them and, and, and see what they are. And they're, they're, some of them will be laughing, some will be crying, some will be sleeping, some will be drooling. They won't necessarily know why they're here or where they are, but think about what they as babies already know. They know on some deep level that they're being held, 
They know on a level that they're being kept warm and they know that they're being loved. And may all of us as God's children know what that feels like. We're gonna sing the families down to the first two verses of the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. It's 147 in your hymnal and sing out, babies love it when you sing to them. What a wonderful sight this is, huh? Just fantastic. Uh, we're so glad to uh, have all these babies bring their parents down uh, to, uh, uh, to be here and for us to meet these uh, babies that uh, have been added to our church family in the last year. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. We'll start down on this end. And if you all can step forward just a little so maybe folks can, can see you. I'm Brian Tolson. This is my wife, Nicole, and our newest addition, Turner. We're the Smithermans, and this is our little girl, Tessa. Hi, I'm Brooke Schumann. This is my husband, Chris, and this is Austin and Tyler, and our newest addition, Kendall. Hi, we're the McQuillers, and this is Daniel Miles McQuiller, our newest addition, and this is Big Brother Maxwell. Hi, I'm Julie Dean. This is my husband, Carrie, and our daughter, Clara, and our little baby, Georgia Rose. I, I'm responsible. Um, we're the Watkins family. I'm Whitney. This is my husband, Kyle, and this is our newest son, Conrad. Hi, we're the Ledger Woods, and this is Paige Madison. Hello, we're the Landreth family, and this is William Henry Landreth. Hi, we're the George family. I'm Laurie. This is my husband, Darren, and this is our son, Harrison James. Hi, we're the Coffee family. family. I'm Lainey. This is Adam, and this is Lincoln James. Hi, we're Sarah and Scott Settle. This is Andrew and big sister Hadley and big brother Owen. Hi, we're the Waltons. I'm Kaylee, and this is my husband, Matt, and this is our son, Conrad. Hi, we're Beth and Will Babb, and this is our daughter, Charlotte. We're Sarah and Stephen Pepper. This is our daughter, Alice, and this is our newest, Andrew William Pepper. <laughs> just, just had to add that in there. Hard to follow that one. 
<laughs> Josh and Brandy Lug, and this is uh, Wit. We're the Shives. I'm Trevor. This is Amber. And this is our daughter, Lily Joy, and our newest addition, Jack Allen. Hi, we're the Girlies. Uh, I'm Jared. This is Ashley, and our son, Blake. Hi, we're the Waters family. This is Zachary. We're the Babish family. Uh, this is Reese, the newest one, and big brothers Turner and Mason. Good morning. My name is Tommy Brown. This is my wife, Stacy, and this is big sister Vivian and little sister Caroline. I'm Kim Rollins. My husband, Landon, is at Drill this weekend, so I have everybody. This is big brother Aiden and Cadence, and this is Kellen, our newest addition. Hi, we're the Murray family. This is Matthew, and I'm Ashley, and this is our newest addition, Patrick. Hi, we're the Kendrick family. I'm Philip, and this is my wife, Debbie, and this is our newest, Hadley May. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, you're pretty dead weight. Yeah, you can do it. Hi, we're the Long family, and this is my foster son, Michael Aiden Galloway. Hi, we're the Jad Rizich family. Uh, I'm Matt. This is my wife, Kelly, and this is our newest son, Grant Stephen. We are the Hammer family. This is Victoria, and this is Nathan. Hi, we're the Kinson family. Uh, my name is Jonathan, my wife, Amanda, and our newest addition, Cole. Well, I, th I think that's everybody. We, you know, isn't it fun being part of Baby Palooza this morning? Well, I mean, I don't think that we've ever had the wraparound that we have today. I mean, this is great. Next year, perhaps all the way to the back. Who knows? Well, we get to continue to enjoy this, to savor this, by looking at our bulletin. All of us have a part here beginning with parents, going to the congregation, and then I hope you'll notice that we are all singing together. We are your church family. Mr. Mark, this looks strangely like the tune to Jesus Loves Me. It, excellent. And parents, it's not as if you don't have your hands full right now. So let me go ahead and give you the magic words. Your response two times will be, we are blessed, and we will bless, okay? We are blessed, and we will bless. So here we go. A child is a wonderful and precious gift, and our loving God has placed this gift in your capable hands. We are blessed, and we will bless. Children give us all so much simply by being themselves. And they help us remember what matters most in life, grace, hope, and love. We are blessed, and we will bless. Congregation, your turn. As you know so well, a gift so precious comes with tremendous responsibility. But you do not bear this responsibility alone. You have a loving God and a loving church family. From baptism to third grade Bible presentation, from confirmation to graduation, God is with you and we are with you. Through every lost lovey, every skin knee, and every loose tooth along the way, God is with you and we are with you. We are your church family. We are here for you. We are proud of you and we love you. God is with you, and we are with you.
Oh, gracious God, for all your blessings, we are always grateful, and we are so grateful for these children and for these families, for the parents and their siblings, and we uh, pray your blessing upon them. And we are so grateful that they are part of this family and we are part of theirs, and that we together are your church right now in the present. And for these gifts, for all your goodness, for your grace and love, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a good choice all of us made being in church today. Congratulations on that. Being able to be part of the baby celebration, being able to worship as a church family, this really is something we should not take for granted. And we don't take for granted all of you who are here today, and we would like to know that you've been here. So if you haven't done it yet, I invite you to take your connection card, the side panel from the bulletin, and Tear that off, make that tear in the center, and if you would fill out the upper part and place it in the offering plate, we really appreciate that. With the lower part, as Taylor said earlier, it's a reminder that we can all come back this evening at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary to enjoy Choral Union with Focus 8. And also, if you go to our website, it will be an opportunity for you to, to see things going on in the life of the church, hear stories from people within the church, uh, all those things being ways that we can be reminded that we are loved by God and given the opportunity to go out and share that love. So with all that in mind, I invite the ushers to come forward now for our time of the presentation of tithes and offerings. Loving and gracious God, we do praise you, and we give you thanks for all the blessings of life 
and for this chance that we have to join with one another in thanking you by sharing your blessings beyond this place. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen.
God of hope and love, God of all that is beautiful and good, we confess that often your ways are hidden from us. We look around and question all that seems to be about destruction, all violence and corruption, all suffering and loss. Pain is real and so is our bewilderment. Yet we are a people of hope and we live out our calling to be your people of love and grace, your people of healing and reconciliation in spite of our questions. And so we renew our commitment to trust you with our lives, to trust the promises you have made throughout the ages, to trust your gracious love that never abandons. Teach us to see with eyes that are not so narrowed that we cannot see beyond our own small world. Teach us to maintain hope and faith as the foundations of our lives instead of reacting to the fear that is so often cultivated in our culture. The fear is real, but the answers lack a faithful response. Teach us to love in spite of rejection, to seek healing in spite of the pain that may be given, to offer grace in the face of evil, and to act justly in times where it may be a costly decision. Gracious, gracious and ever faithful God, as you have put your trust in us to be your people, let us put our trust in you to be our God and to provide all that is needed. For we ask this in Christ our Lord, who asked us to speak in one voice this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The passage of scripture that I'll read in just a moment comes from the middle of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah really is three books, has three distinct sections, first, often called first, second, and third Isaiah. The first section is chapters 1 through 39 of the book, and it is really filled mostly with warnings about not being faithful to God, particularly in the way we treat, or the people to whom it was addressed, the people were treating one another. It warns of impending disaster. And then there is the second section. The disaster has happened. It is the exile into Babylon for the people of God, for, uh, for Judah, for Jerusalem. And they have now been exiled, and it is a section of comfort and hope in trying to give them a perspective on the situation in which they find themselves now, uh, a new perspective. And then it's that last section, and that runs, by the way, chapters 40 through 55, and then the last section, 56 through 66, 3rd Isaiah, 
is following the return in the period of rebuilding and reestablishing. And it is also filled with, in a sense, warnings, a, a call to be faithful to God, a reminder of uh, previous times, but a call to, to faithfulness for the people. So it's from that center section, in fact, the first chapter of that section of hope and comfort that our reading comes, <clears throat> as Isaiah seeks to give the people a new perspective. Listen to these words. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Wasn't it announced to you from the beginning? Haven't you understood since the earth was founded? God's in, God inhabits the earth's horizon. Its inhabitants are like locusts, stretches out the skies like a curtain and spreads it out like a, tw a tent for dwelling. God makes dignitaries useless and the earth's judges into nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely is their shoot rooted in the earth when God breathes on them and they dry up and the windstorm carries them off like straw. So to whom will you compare me and who is my equal, says the Holy One? Look up at the sky and consider, who created these? Uh, the one who brings out their attendants one by one, summoning each of them by name. Because of God's great strength and mighty power, not one is missing. Why do you say, Jacob, and declare, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord my God. My God ignores my predicament. Don't you know? H haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow tired or weary. His understanding is beyond human reach, giving power to the tired and reviving the exhausted. Youths will become tired and weary. Young men will certainly stumble. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will fly up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not be weary. God speaks to us in the reading of Scripture. Perspective. Perspective. How important that is. I remember as a young student in art classes, first learning about perspective. Learning how... Perspective will take a flat piece of paper, two dimensions, and give it depth. Now, I am not an artist by any stretch of the imagination. It was very difficult for me. And I learned, of course, the, the sidewalk was easy. You can do that sidewalk or road right down the middle and make it go to a point, and that gives you perspective. But then, when you begin to fill out the pi picture more and more, perspective becomes more and more difficult to maintain. It's those difficult parts of the picture that really challenge the ability to maintain perspective. And if you don't maintain perspective, then it sort of messes the whole thing up. The whole picture gets skewed and it begins to sort of flatten everything out or at least make it all look kind of strange. The importance of perspective. To me, that's a kind of parable for life, really, how important perspective is and how it is the proper perspective that gives life really depth and how hard it is sometimes to maintain that perspective throughout because of some challenge going on over here in this section of life, some difficulty. It's easy to lose perspective there and it begins to skew the whole picture begins to sort of flatten the whole thing out and you can lose perspective all the way around. Perspective is really important. Now perspective, of course, is not just a term having to do with visual art. Perspective is a way in which it is the term that describes how we see things. And often it is used as a, syn a synonym for seeing things accurately the way in which they need to be seen. Seeing the reality, the way things really are. Sometimes we call that perspective. Perspective is helpful sometimes, and it's hurtful 
other times. We can see this, this in Isaiah's words when he is quoting the people. And they're asking the question, really, is God in this or not? I mean, does God care about us? Imagine these people are hundreds of miles away from their homes. Jerusalem lies in ruins. The temple has been destroyed. The city walls are destroyed. Wild animals are running in the streets of Jerusalem. They're far from home. They've lost family members. They don't know where some friends and family even are. And some have been killed in the, uh, the fighting. And they are exiled away from everything dear to them. This is a terrible time. And the perspective that they have is that this must mean God doesn't care about us. God is somewhere far off. God is distant. These gods of the Babylonians really must be uh, all-powerful. And these kings and all of these rulers, they're the ones who are really running things, and there's no recourse for us. We are utterly alone, and we are weak and tired, and there's nothing to be done about it. That's their perspective. And so it's Isaiah who wants to give them a different perspective, not a hurtful one like that, but a helpful perspective. Because perspective makes all the difference in the world. It gives life depth. And it's difficult to maintain perspective when times are hard. When there's difficulty anywhere in life. And yet Isaiah says to them that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And, and they will fly up on wings of eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Isaiah wants to give the perspective that God is great indeed. God is the creator of all. But God is, is not away someplace far away, uninvolved, uncaring. But God is in their midst. And God provides them the strength they need. That's the perspective. It's the perspective that we need in our lives. In the times when it just seems like things are going wrong, when things are off the rails, when there are difficulties that come our way, when there's a problem over in this part of life and we lose perspective there, it tends to skew the perspective on the whole picture of our lives. And the perspective that Isaiah gives, the perspective Jesus gives, gives in his teachings and in his life is God is with us. We're not alone in this. And that at the times when we are weak, God's strength comes through. Those who wait on the Lord, he says, will renew their strength. Now, in, our, in the translation I read a moment ago, that's the common English Bible, a newer translation. It says those who hope in the Lord. Translations are done by committees of scholars and they intentionally use that word hope here instead of wait. Why do they do that? Well, because for us, uh, the English word wait is, is a word that simply means doing nothing until something happens, really. It's just a very passive thing to wait. But the Hebrew word that is usually tr translated to wait is a much more active word. It has the connotation of stretching, of pulling, of twisting. It's interesting. Something's going on in this period of, of waiting. It is an active word. And we can see in Scripture that whenever there is this period of waiting, something is going on. It may be waiting in the wilderness to inherit the promised land, but in that waiting, they are on a journey and they're learning and they are receiving what they need for the journey that is to come. It's an active kind of waiting. And it is a, a, a kind of waiting that has a sense of what is to come. It's waiting with a certain perspective, and that makes all the difference in the world. This week, is in thinking about perspective, I, I went uh, on the Internet, I Googled the word perspective, and one of the first things that popped up was a TED Talk by a guy named Rory Sutherland. Rory Sutherland lives in London, and he was talking about 
perspective as making all the difference in the world. He said, and we know this is true, that the circumstances of our lives can be one thing, but the most important thing is the perspective or the way that we view those circumstances. That's what really makes the difference. That's what really matters ultimately. It's that perspective. And so he went on to talk about waiting. Now, of course, he wasn't talking about this text or, or anything related to this, but he did bring up this issue of waiting and how perspective matters. He said the most important change that the London Underground has made is to put up the little dot, dot matrix displays that tell you how long it is till the next train arrives because it makes all the difference in the world in what the wait is like. He said it may be seven uh, uh, minutes to the next train, but you don't really care if it's seven minutes as long as that tells you in seven minutes there's a train coming. But he said it may be four minutes to the next train, but if you have no idea how long it is to the next train, that four minutes can seem forever. Perspective. It's the way of seeing in the midst of waiting. He said that in Korea they're experimenting with these uh, stoplights, traffic lights, where the red light counts down how long you have to wait. It has a little circle and uh, the red goes away all around the circle and when it reaches the end, then the light turns green. It has reduced accidents in Korea because people know how long they're going to have to wait. It's such a simple thing. But it's waiting with a sense of what is to come. It's waiting with a little bit of certainty about when this thing is going to end. It's waiting with a different perspective. He said they also tried this in China, but they got it a little wrong. They, uh, they did it on green lights. Now think about it. You're coming up to an intersection. The light is green and it's counting down how much longer it's going to be green. And so you put the pedal to the metal. And so they found that it increased accidents when they did that. It's a little bit like downtown, those pedestrian deals. Have you noticed that? It's telling the pedestrians how long they can safely cross the road, and it counts down. But if you're driving and you see that the light's going to change in seven, six, five, four, what do you do? You speed up to get through the, the light going on the flow with the pedestrians. That's not the intent, but you don't do that, do you? I just realized it's just me. I'm the only one who does that. Perspective. Perspective. That's what really makes the difference. And this issue of waiting with a certain perspective is what Isaiah is talking about. Those who wait on the Lord, those who wait in this different kind of way, not without purpose, not with nothing to do, but waiting with a purpose and waiting actively. And that's what waiting really is about. And those who wait on the Lord will renew their strengths, strength and they will uh, take uh, wings and they will soar like eagles and they will run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Waiting with a purpose. Somebody said it this way, I thought this was really a great way to think about it. To wait on the Lord is kind of like if you are a, a waiter. You don't just wait for the people to finish. You don't just stand there and wait for something to happen. If you are a wait person, then what you are doing is serving. And those who wait on the Lord are serving in that period of time. It's active waiting in order to renew strength and to soar once again. Um, you know that um, I'm a pilot, or you may not know that. I, I try to minimize to some extent the times I talk about flying in the pulpit because not everybody is excited and as interested in that as, as I am. But somebody this last week, or maybe it was the week before last, were meeting in my office. They saw my aviation memorabilia in the office, and uh, they said to me, I didn't know you were a pilot. And I thought, oh, it's been too long since I've talked about it in the pulpit. Uh, so... So it's time uh, again. But I, I just want to lift up an image for you. There is in flying something called ground effect. 
A ground effect is reduced drag and increased lift when the aircraft is close to the ground. And it's important. It's important for a lot of reasons. When, when you rotate, that is when you leave the runway uh, to soar up on takeoff, you want, to, uh, you want to reach the proper speed before you do that or the aircraft doesn't have enough flow over the wings uh, to, uh, to climb out safely. And so you have to have enough lift. And so you reach a certain airspeed to do that. But you can leave the ground sooner than that, and you can, uh, you can do that if you stay in ground effect. If you stay just above the runway, you can continue to increase your speed, uh, and then when you reach the rotation speed, you can go ahead and climb out. That's important. It's important if you're on a, uh, at a soft field, an unpaved runway. You want to get off the ground as soon as possible to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the friction, the drag uh, by, from the ground. And so you lift off into ground effect, but you don't want to climb out too soon because the aircraft doesn't have enough lift. And so you stay in ground effect for a while. And then when you have done that with patience, then you can climb on out. It's ground effect. I learned the value of this uh, in a new way the other day. I was flying out of Spinks Airport and there was a coyote over next to the runway. And I thought, well, surely when I get close to the coyote, he was, he was probably 50 feet off the side of the runway, that he will run in the other direction because of the noise of the plane and all of that. But as I was approaching the coyote on, um, uh, when about, to, about to take off, uh, on my takeoff roll, he ran toward the runway. It was like, oh, an airplane. And so he headed straight toward the side of the runway. And I'm watching him and I realize, you know, he may come on to the runway. And so I decided to lift off early and remain in ground effect until I got up enough speed to climb out safely. And, uh, you know, that was really a valuable thing. As I passed by this coyote, he's standing right on the edge of the runway. I almost expected him to wave, you know, as I went, <laughs> went by. He was just looking at me right there. But what if he had run out in front of me? Well, I would have had the benefit of ground effect to have me just above the head of this coyote, and I could have safely gone on by. But I had to wait. I had to wait until I had enough speed to go ahead and climb out. To me... I love the name of that, ground effect. We talk about being grounded in God, that God is the ground of our being. God is the ground of all that is. And we gain our strength in this kind of waiting in ground effect until we have the strength to soar again. It's a perspective on waiting. It's a perspective on our lives that says, we're not alone. God is with us in this and, and wait on the Lord actively living our lives and God will give us the strength even in our exhaustion and confusion and whatever we're experiencing to soar yet again. It's a perspective and it matters. This past um, Friday I had the opportunity to uh, gain perspective. Sometimes we hear something. Sometimes we experience something that gives us perspective. And this past Friday morning at the uh, Day Resource Center breakfast, there was an opportunity for that. Uh, at the Day Resource Center breakfast, Day Resource Center is a place where homeless people can go during the day to have all sorts of services, to, to take a shower, to do laundry, uh, to have a cool or a warm place. Uh, where they can go to watch uh, some television. There are all kinds of services available to them. But we didn't always have a day resource center. In 1997, a, a reporter for the Star-Telegram named Jeff Gwynn, uh, many of you will remember this, spent a week on the streets of Fort Worth as a homeless person. He left behind his cash, his credit cards, his ID, and all of that, and uh, put on some old clothes, lived as a homeless person on the streets of Fort Worth, and he gave everyone a new perspective of what that's like. And it mobilized Fort Worth. Our church was an important part of that. Our First Street Mission was an important part of that, and Jeff Gwynn talked about that. He talked about the importance of the mission, and he talked about Linda McDermott, Reverend Linda McDermott how instrumental she was. She was the one who invited him to speak in this pulpit, and it was the first faith community 
uh, to which he spoke back then. And it mobilized this church and it mobilized so many others uh, to, um, to do something, to make the lives of those homeless better. And um, I've already sent greetings, but he did send greetings. Uh, I mentioned her in the first service to Linda uh, with his love. And he said of, of Linda, by the way, she is one of the finest pastors in Fort Worth. And I agree. I agree with that for sure. She had a huge part to play in that, but it was, a, it was a perspective that he brought that made a difference. And Friday, it was a new perspective for me, really. You know, you can let some stuff going on in your life over here where you get your perspective messed up and it just sort of flattens out the whole thing if you're not careful and kind of skews everything. And so you need those times when you remember, wow, my problems are nothing compared to others. And the perspective is, I'm not just sitting around doing nothing, waiting for something to happen. I need to be busy, and I need to be about what God calls me to do. And so that's what perspective does for us. That breakfast began with one of the most wonderful prayers I have ever heard at an event such as that. And it was prayed by uh, my friend and colleague, Carl Travis. He's the pastor at First Presbyterian uh, Church here in Fort Worth, uh, and also a neighbor of ours. They live across the street and a couple of houses down. Carl prayed the prayer at the beginning, and I've only changed it to take out the references to breakfast uh, because it was a breakfast meeting, and, and so he, he had a few words about thanksgiving for the food. But otherwise, this is his prayer, and I invite you to make it your prayer as I, as I read it. Holy God, it's an up-down world. You up in heaven, us down here climbing toward you. We are convinced that this is the way things are, so we build it into our brains, assemble it into our understanding, embed it in our language. We climb up the economic ladder. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We look up to some people and down upon others. Presidents are surely more valuable than paupers. CEOs are certainly higher than custodians, right? But God, what if we have assigned you the wrong address? What if there is no need to climb toward you because you are not up at all? Not up, but beside us, next to us, nose to nose with us. And God, if we stand shoulder to shoulder with you, shouldn't we stand shoulder to shoulder with one another? Holy God, sharpen our senses, focus our thoughts, challenge our up-down assumptions, then knock us sideways. Shift our gaze 90 degrees so we see not up and down, but left and right, so we see our shared circumstance and common context with people without shelter. Then, God, shine upon us in a thousand shades of grace. As you have showered us with spirit and substance, inspire us to empathy, action, generosity. Amen. As we prepare for our closing hymn in the end of the worship service, if you have been visiting with us and if you have come to the decision that you would like to be beside those here uh, as a faith community, we would be honored to welcome you today as a new member of this church. As we sing our closing hymn, Dr. Smith and Dr. Brewster will be here at the communion rail. I know they would be honored if you came forward uh, to welcome you and to give thanks for your presence in this church. So with that in mind, let us now stand and raise our voices to God.
I'm, I'm going to say Robert's last name, Peewitz. We've had the trouble, some of us have had trouble getting that. But he's been faithful and we're delighted to have him come today. I had the pleasure of showing him about last week and um, I realized myself what a beautiful place we have here to worship and um, fellowship. And Robert comes from the First United Methodist Church in Victoria and he brings with him Jack Preston who's a little too old to be introduced earlier. <laughs> now, this is Amanda Reynolds. Amanda and I have become uh, email friends, and uh, she's coming from the Klein United Methodist Church in Spring, Texas. And Tom Garrison is here transferring from another denomination, and we welcome you all. No, First United Methodist Church. I'm sorry. Laredo, Texas. Sorry about that. Oh, thank you. And um, uh, it's sure nice to welcome you all. Glad to have you as part of our church family. And as you become a part of this congregation, I ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? Yes. Welcome. Uh, again to all of you. I'm going to ask you to uh, remain down front so that you have a, a, folks have an opportunity to come and welcome you. Vochisade is, is standing here and uh, tonight at six o'clock, let me remind you here, uh, Vochisade, Choral Union, Brass, Organ, it will be wonderful experience and they're going to give you a little sample. They are very versatile in their music. It's, it's uh, not just sacred music, it's not uh, just the sort of usual choral music that you would expect. So they're going to give us a little sample of some other kind of music they will be doing this evening. <laughs> You can hear the rest of that this evening at six o'clock. Be sure and bring, uh, bring a friend and uh, let them experience our wonderful church and this wonderful music that we will experience at, at 6 o'clock today. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.